Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Gyanam Jana Shalakaya Chakshuru Nilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Predictions about Maharaj Parikshit. Yudhishthir Maharaj and his brothers were very concerned how is this boy going to be? Will he be a proper follower of the Pandavas or not? So they're very pleased to hear the, the predictions of his future behavior. So much concern. They were very concerned that this child be a great king for the sake of maintaining the family prestige and because Maharaj Yudhishthir was concerned about the citizens, he also wanted that the citizens get a proper king in the future. And also, of course, natural affection. This is his grandchild. And so much concern. From the very beginning, the child will be looked after very nicely. You see, even now, especially in Bengali families, how much care is given to the children. Gopad told Prabhupada Maharaj to preach in Bangladesh with the courage of an Englishman, because he's from Britain, and the heart of a Bengali mother. So naturally, every mother is concerned about her children. Of course, in the modern age, sometimes very unnatural that the parents don't care for their children. Child? Oh, problem. Abortion. Kill. That is unnatural. It's natural that the mother will care for the child. And here we see Maharaj Yudhishthir was more concerned because he understood this child is very special. Anyway, it must be special coming in the line of the Pandavas, the son of a uh, great father and great mother. But even more special because he was already protected by Lord Krishna in the womb. Mm. So he was concerned how this child will be brought up. So this, we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, not just like some stories, but so that we can get some instruction to guide us in our life, so that we can attain the same perfection as Maharaj Parikshit and Maharaj Yudhishthir. So an important point here is the concern that was shown by Maharaj Yudhishthir for Maharaj Parikshit. We see that when Maharaj Yudhishthir was asking questions from the Brahmanas, he was saying, will he be a good king, will he be a good descendant of the Pandavas? So many questions he asked. But he said, above all, most important thing, will he be a great devotee of Krishna? So that was the concern, that this soul has been sent to us to look after, by Daiva Karanat, by the will of the Lord. Therefore, our duty is to look after him, so that he will become a first-class devotee of Krishna. So that concern was there. The same thing, people are joining our Krishna conscious movement. We should see these people are sent by Krishna. So it's our concern to look after them, so they also become devotees of Krishna, first-class devotees of Krishna. Because after all, it's not so easy to make devotees. All the activities in this Krishna conscious movement, they're all meant for making people into devotees. But practically we see not many people are very interested. So if somebody comes forward to take interest in Krishna consciousness, then how much concern we should be to nourish their Krishna consciousness. Now that means taking some trouble. It's much easier just to chant our rounds and don't bother me. But to look after the devotees, that is a labor of love. Just like the parents look after the children. Children, they're passing stool on the mother, crying in the middle of the night. But she thinks, oh, this is my child, I must look after her. Tolerates all the nonsense of the child. Because after all, children are just nonsense. And tolerates that and slowly, slowly trains them. So the same thing, when someone first comes to Krishna consciousness, they're 99% nonsense. They don't know how to behave properly, they don't know how to talk properly. But that 1% non-nonsense, which means sense, that come to Krishna, that is what we're looking for. Everybody in this world is nonsense. That's why we're here. But if someone gets an idea, all right, let me try to do something in Krishna consciousness, then we have to find that spark. Find the spark means gradually it will increase. So how much patience is required? Prabhupada said, I have to shed three tons of blood just to make one devotee. And practically we see that uh, Prabhupada, early days of Krishna consciousness, he was personally serving all the devotees. First devotees, when they came for their initiation ceremony, they came in their jeans with their long hair. Prabhupada made the whole ceremony, cooked the whole big feast. They served everyone prasadam. And they all said, wow, thank you Swamiji, that was a great feast. And they all left and Prabhupada cleaned up everything. Because Prabhupada knew they have no culture, they're they're just hippies. I mean, they don't even have the basic human decency to think, to help, because they're brought up, they have such a selfish way of life. But gradually, Prabhupada trained them. Prabhupada called it tightening the screw. That, uh, first of all, he captured them. First of all, he captured them by his affection and concern. Then, when they were dedicated to him, boom, yes, now you become disciple, surrender. Now you have to follow. Now you do what I say. Go all over the world and preach. So like this, Prabhupada, he was showing so much concern 
for all his disciples and spreading Krishna consciousness widely all over the world. Prabhupada, he traveled all over the world and his disciples, they also traveled to different places and made different branches of Krishna consciousness. And by his potency, which they carried, his disciples were also able to make more devotees because they reflected the wonderful Krishna conscious qualities of Srila Prabhupada. People were attracted and they also gave their life to Krishna. Of course, Srila Prabhupada is unique. No one was, was able to be like him. Sometimes people imitated, but they couldn't be like him. And because devotees, they were sent different places to preach, but they themselves were quite new, sometimes they made different kinds of mistakes. It's just like on the battlefield, there's a shortage of doctors. So if there's only one doctor, he goes around helping the people who are wounded. And then those who are wounded, who become a little bit better by his treatment, because of the shortage of doctors, he engages them also in helping the other people who are wounded. They may not be doctors, they may not be 100% expert themselves, but in an emergency, what to do? So in the same way, Prabhupada sp spread this movement. But naturally, the devotees, they sometimes, going here and there, they made mistakes. Uh, of course, Prabhupada was watching over the whole movement, but he couldn't watch every single person at every single moment. And sometimes, due to neophyte mentality or whatever, uh, devotees, they were fighting with each other, they weren't getting on very well together. Prabhupada said, that is your Western disease. You like to fight with each other. He gave different ideas of Western disease. One another was this uh, inordinate attachment to sex life. And another was the uh, always wanting to change something. Prabhupada said, do this. And someone thinks, well, that's good, what Prabhupada said, but maybe we should just do it a little bit differently. So these are all different diseases. But it's not surprising. One time in India, some two of Prabhupada's disciples were fighting. Not just shouting at each other, they were fighting in world boxing championships. So one life member, Indian man, came to Prabhupada, Oh, Swamiji, Swamiji, your disciples are fighting. They're supposed to be sadhus. I'm very surprised. Prabhupada said, are you surprised they're fighting? I'm surprised they're chanting Hare Krishna. So actually that's the fact. And who would have thought that animals with two legs, who their whole life is how to eat, sleep, mate and defend, have meat, fish, eggs, gambling, intoxication and illicit sex, how they should dedicate their life to Krishna. That's amazing. So 30 yeah, years ago, if you went to Vrindavan and told that in future there will be one devotee from the Western country who has dedicated his life to Krishna, giving up all his bad habits and chanting Hare Krishna. Is it? No. Impossible. Westerners, they are mlechas, chandalas, the lowest of the low. Maybe after many lives they could become devotees. Maybe. If you told them that in future there will be a devotee, a, a one devotee who will come from the Western countries and who will recite Srimad Bhagavatam and chant Hare Krishna, you will not believe. And if you told them there will be hundreds and thousands of devotees from all over the world wearing tilak and chanting Hare Krishna. They'll say, you're dreaming. Impossible. And even Prabhupada himself said it was impossible. When he wrote his poem, Going to America, mm. Markine Bhagavad Dharma means Krishna consciousness in America. That is like saying, uh, it's just like something completely impossible, like uh, playing football on the moon or something like that. Krishna conscious means in Vrindavan, in Mayapur, in the villages of Bengal. There's no such thing as Krishna conscious in America. It's just unheard of, impossible. But Prabhupada wrote to Krishna that, Toma Kripai Ashambhav Shambhav Hai. By your mercy, that which is impossible becomes possible. Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangum Landhayate Girin Yat Kripa Tamaham Vande Paramanam Namadavam. There's no such thing as a dumb man reciting poetry. There's no such thing as a lame man climbing over mountains. But it is possible by the grace of Lord Krishna. So all this Krishna conscious movement has become possible by the unprecedented mercy of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sometimes I go to temples and devotees tell me, well, you know, we're living in this temple, and this guy says this, and this guy says that. So I'm just coming for a few days. I can't get involved in all this. But I don't see someone is saying this, and someone is saying that, and I don't like him, and he doesn't like her. I don't see that. I see the devotees are chanting Hare Krishna, worshipping the deities. 
distributing books, taking prasadam, reading Srimad Bhagavatam. I see this is all ecstatic. This is all wonderful. This is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy that in all these places where previously no one was even allowed to even think about chanting Hare Krishna, now there are so many people getting this chance. But sometimes due to Maya, we come to Krishna consciousness and we see, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. But what is right? What is right? The chanting of Hare Krishna is going on. All these things are going on. Class, prasadam, yeah. everyone is... Bhagavatam, prasadam. Everyone is getting the chance to go back home, back to Godhead. The demigods are praying to get this chance. The demigods, Indra, Chandra, Vayu, they're praying to Krishna. Please get me out of this illusion of being a demigod. Mm. Please let me take birth in Iskon. So I can chant Hare Krishna and go back to Godhead. And we are thinking, oh, I don't like this. He's telling me, you cut the subject. And I'm telling him, no, you cut the subject. And Indra and Chandra and Vayu are praying... Please let me cut the subject. And we're thinking, I don't want to cut the subject. I'm going to go home and listen to rock and roll music. That's why Prabhupada used to say, fools and rascals. If anyone has the chance to engage in Krishna consciousness, but instead wants to sit at home and pick their nose, they're a fool and a rascal. So you may think, well, this isn't really Krishna consciousness. Devotees, sometimes they call each other bad names. They say this and they say that. But I read Chaitanya Charitamrita and it's all nectar. Chaitanya Charitamrita, same kind of thing. Gopinath Patanayak is getting arrested by the king because he's corrupt, stealing the money. And they're coming to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, what can I do? He's corrupt. Let me chant Hare Krishna. And Damada Pandit is always criticizing everybody. And even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu got fed up with him and said, why don't you go to Bengal for a few days? I know you're a very nice devotee, but uh, you shouldn't criticize me. Sometimes he used to get very angry at Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to get very angry at Jagadananda Pandit because Jagadananda used to give instruction to Sanatana Goswami. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, "Who are you to instruct Sanatana Goswami? Bandit. He's a million times your superior. He's just like your guru. When you were just a little boy running around naked in the hall in the courtyard, he was already senior devotee. So even in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's leela, it wasn't just everyone was sitting down and crying in ecstasy. Bandit. There was all kinds of things going on." But because they're all pure devotees, then all, they didn't leave, they didn't say, Jagadananda Pandi didn't say, oh, well, forget you, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He didn't say that. He went on with his Krishna consciousness in ecstasy. He thought, oh, this is wonderful, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is chastising me. And he cares for me. That even you find that Advaita Acharya, one time he became very upset with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because Advaita Acharya's servant, uh, what is his name, Kamalaka Pipalai, he was chastised very severely by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, you're a complete rascal, don't ever come and see me ever again. And Advaita, Advaita Acharya said, why are you being so kind to him? If you can chastise someone so strongly, it means you really care for them. You never chastise me, I don't think I'm getting the mercy. So Advaita Acharya thought, how can I make Chaitanya Mahaprabhu so much upset that he'll chastise me? Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to think, well, Advaita Acharya, he's very senior to me, he's the same age as my father. So Advaita Acharya thought, what does Chaitanya Mahaprabhu really dislike a lot? So then he thought about it and he started preaching Mayavad philosophy. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu always respected him. But when he heard that, he started beating him. And Advaita Acharya said, Hari Bhau, Hari Bhau. Now I'm fortunate. Now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has shown me his real mercy. So, this, uh, in devotional life, sometimes it's like that. There may be some kind of, uh, like this. You see the Sahajiyas in Bengal, all they do, oh, very nice, how are you? Oh, how wonderful, you're so great, you're so nice. Prabhupada, he practically didn't do that at all. More, he was smashing his disciples. You fool, you rascal. One time a devotee, he was, Prabhupada was so expert at just completely smashing people's false ego. One time a devotee said to Prabhupada, I'm the most fallen. Prabhupada said, you're not the most anything. You're just insignificant. So in this way, Prabhupada, he was showing his love by... <laughs> of course, we ourselves, we're not on the level of Srila Prabhupada. So we should be very careful in our dealings with devotees, so as not to burn them out, fry them out, fry them to a crisp, etc. Mm. At the same time, devotees shouldn't think there will be utopia. I will join the Krishna Conscious Movement and everything will be completely wonderful in every respect. One time a devotee came to, uh, one man came to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And he said, I think many of your disciples, they're not very sincere. They're fighting, some of them are lazy. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, this is the hospital. 
What do you expect in the hospital? Everyone's sick. But at least they're getting treatment. If we throw them out, then uh, there's no chance of them being saved. If they stay here, at least there's a chance. So we shouldn't expect utopia. That Prabhupada wrote in some letters. But, uh, some devotees complain that, oh, the devotees in this temple, they are fighting. This is due to impersonalism. Prabhupada said, no, this is because of personalism. Because impersons don't fight. Only persons can fight. So this proves our philosophy, that everyone's a person. And Prabhupada said, don't expect utopia. Don't expect that you join the Krishna Conscious Movement, someone's going to come with a fan and offer you Maha Prasadam. There may be many difficulties we have to live through. Even devotees, we're living together, all together. Like I was saying, close association, 20 people in a room. So there may not be people we would choose to be friends with. It may not be according to our taste or liking. But that is devotional life. We accept whatever situation we put in as an opportunity to advance. Yeah. And even if the devotees may not be exactly as we want them to be, Who's still on? they're the most glorious people in the universe. Because they're surrendering to Krishna. At least they're trying. And even if someone says to you, we'll do so many different things, what does it matter? Still, you're getting the chance to chant Hare Krishna. Yeah. Still, you're getting the chance to engage in devotional service. Still, you're getting the chance to very easily go back to home, back to Godhead, by associating with devotees. Oh, sometimes, sometimes we see devotees, they say, well, I think for my spiritual life, it's better for me to leave the temple, because then my mind will be very peaceful. I won't have this guy on my case all the time. And, you know, I can sleep enough, and uh, I, can, I can have enough time for reading. And, and in a very peaceful way, I'll prosecute Krishna consciousness. But what happens is, very peacefully, such devotees, they go home and they very peacefully sleep. And service goes down 90%, 99%. And they very peacefully talk all nonsense with all their friends and family. And they very peacefully watch the television. And they very peacefully lose all their spiritual life. So better, that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, that better to live in a cage surrounded by fire, or better to live with a tiger than to live with non-devotees. Because it's so dangerous to spoil our spiritual life. You, you say, well, it's all right, but because Swami's sitting on a big chair and talking about these things. But what about the real problems? We have very real problems. I agree. Real problems. Birth, death, old age and disease. These are the real problems. And we have real solutions. That is, Tadhyara Charana Shevi Bhakta Shanivas Janame Janame Mori Abhilash To live in the association of devotees, execute Krishna consciousness. Anande Balo Hari Bhajya Vrindavan Shri Guru Vaishnava Pade Maji Yama Chant Hare Krishna and be happy. Anande Bolo Hari. Worship Vrindavan and become absorbed in the instructions and mercy of Guru and Vaishnavas. This is the solution to all problems. Even you may say, well, sometimes they don't. Devotees, they're fighting with each other. So what is the solution? Should we sit down and have a meeting? And then someone will say, well, he said this. And you say, well, well he I said that. Know. Well, you don't know what he said. He said this. Well, that's because you said that. And you have a big meeting, then you have a wrestling match and a boxing match, and everyone goes away like this. So what is the solution? The solution is chant Hare Krishna. You say, no, no, that's too simple. We don't believe that. We're, ch we're already chanting Hare Krishna. I'm chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. chanting my rounds and thinking, that guy. Ah. So <laughs> Prabhupada, he told that in the temple, if devotees are not getting with each other, what should they do? This is Prabhupada's solution. Prabhupada said, that there should be kirtan three times a day with dancing. This is the solution. Why? Because if you chant and dance with devotees, especially dancing together, then how can we feel any bad feeling? And when we chant in that happy mood, then we realize that all these things, it's all nonsense anyway. What does it matter in these things? We're chanting Hare Krishna. Jai Shokal Bipod Bhakti Vinod Bolen Jokanananda. This is Bhakti Vinod Thakur solution. When you chant Hare Krishna, all problems go away. So this is the solution. We're preaching this to the whole world. So we should also institute it in our own temples. Temple president should see, oh, someone is not behaving properly with another, he should punish him. Your punishment is you must dance and jump very hard. This way you overcome all the bad things. And it may take some time. After all, just a short time ago, we were all eating cows, eating our mothers. Yeah. We were all rakshasas. So it takes a little time for a rakshasa to change into a Vaishnava. Still, we should try to behave more like Vaishnavas and less like Rakshasas. As long as we remain Rakshasas, we can't go back to the spiritual world. So we see here, Parikshit Maharaj, how much concern 
Yudhishthira Maharaj as for him. So this way we should also be very concerned for the other devotees. We should act in such a way with other devotees that they will be inspired to become more and more Krishna conscious. We see some devotees just by their association and others they feel, oh, Krishna conscious is so wonderful. Of course, Prabhupada. And uh, Prabhupada, his very dear disciple, Jayananda Prabhu was, was like that also. Jayananda was famous. He would go among all the bums and all kinds of funny people in San Francisco. And he would get them to engage in devotional service. And even many years after Jayananda passed away, people would say, uh, they would say about Jayananda, maybe be some complete karmi, a huge beer gut like this, and big cigarette smoking. He said, oh, I remember I met your Jayananda. You're from the Hare Krishna movement? I don't know anything about Hare Krishna. But if your Jayananda is from Hare Krishna, it must be good. Actually, they called him Jay. They made his name short, Jay. So, so someone told me, we used to do books in San Francisco. And people, they used to meet people sometimes. Now they're making a biography of Jayananda Prabhu. But I think this story may not be included. Maybe or maybe not be. Because anyway, Jayananda, those days our movement didn't have much money. And Jayananda gave all his money to Prabhupada, his life savings, $5,000. And he worked hard day and night for Krishna, literally day and night. He was one devotee who... Uh, mostly he didn't come to Prabhupada's classes and darshans. Prabhupada never chastised him because he knew he's always busy in Krishna's service. And even one time he came to a darshan, immediately he fell asleep. Prabhupada didn't chastise him because he knew he's so busy that any time he sits down, he'll automatically fall asleep. And what happened that uh, whenever anyone came, they were interested in Krishna consciousness, they would, all the devotees would immediately send him to Jayananda, let him preach to them. So one devotee, Dhanavir Prabhu, who is one of our gurus in Iskand, he told me, when he first came to the temple, he said, you should go and see Jayananda. So where is he? Where can I find him? Well, at this time he's probably taking the garbage out the back. So he went out the back and saw Jayananda taking out the garbage. And he saw he looked so blissful. He said, how is it that you're so happy? Jayananda said, I don't know, I don't have time to think about it. Now he said, you see this pile of garbage? Just help me carry it out. So that story I was going to tell. Anyway... The temple president at that time, I think, was Kesha. So Jayananda, he had these really old pair of pants. <laughs> and he used to do all this work, taking out all the garbage with this really old pair of pants. And it was sewn up about 25 times. So Kesha told him, Jayananda, you've got to get a new pair of pants. It's, you know, it doesn't look good. But Jayananda said, no, I don't want to spend Krishna's money. Kesha kept on insisting. So one day Jayananda agreed. Actually, Keshav in completely insists. He said, look, Jayananda, I respect you, I love you, but I'm the town president, you've got to do what I say. Here's $10, go and buy a new pair of pants. So Jayananda went, he went to the store, and he, saw, he went and he saw a pair of pants. So he said, well, can I try them on? So he went on the changing room, and he put on the pair of pants. And then he put on the other old pair of pants on top of them, and started walking out of the store. So the salesman called him and said, uh, excuse me, sir, Please just come and see our security staff here. So they brought him to the police, and he was brought to court after some days. And the magistrate said that, uh, well, you've joined a religious society, so why is it you're stealing? It doesn't seem very proper. <laughs> so Jayananda, he said that, he, he just explained that, you know, we're serving Krishna, and uh, we have so much work to do for Krishna, and it just makes me feel terrible spending Krishna's money for my own personal sense gratification. So he was so sincere and straightforward that everyone appreciated what he said. So the magistrate said that, yes, I appreciate you're a very saintly person, but I think you should at least pay the store for the pants. And the sales assistant who had caught him, he was also at the hearing. So he said, Your Honor, I'll pay for the pants. Such a genuine devotee that everyone was influenced by him. He didn't know many shlokas. He, he didn't, I mean, he was just a very, very simple person in many ways. But he completely gave himself to Krishna. And Prabhupada appreciated him so much that he said that every Rathiyatra, Jayananda's picture must be there. Don't so all over the world, more and more, Rathiyatras are there, Jayananda for those pictures. There. Prabhupada was so much appreciated. Prabhupada wrote a letter to him after he passed away. Prabhupada said, I am missing your association. When I first started this movement, you gave me $5,000, your life savings for printing books. And you served me very sincerely. So he said, Prabhupada said, that if you had a pinch of material desire still, then you would have gone to the heavenly planets. But I think you've probably gone straight back to Godhead. And how did Prabhupada finish all his letters? He often used to finish his letters. Thank you very much. 
So we shouldn't worry too much. There's this problem, that problem, another problem. Just we should act in such a way within this Krishna conscious movement that when we leave this world, that our spiritual master will say, thank you very much. You have been a good servant. You have tried your best. Now I bless you, you go back home, back to God. So this is our aim of life. We should always keep that in focus. That whatever anyone says to us, Project. what everyone says or does, it doesn't matter. Our business is to serve Krishna, that's all. And if we keep on with that, it doesn't matter. The whole, everything, the whole world may turn upside down. But Krishna is always God. And we are always His eternal servant. So our only business is to serve Him. It doesn't matter what anybody says or does. We are determined to keep to our Krishna consciousness. No one can take that away. Only we, out of our foolishness, we may give it up. So we should all make this determination to stay in this Krishna conscious movement and work together to do good for others. What does it matter if someone says something that we don't like? It's very insignificant. We have the chance to chant Hare Krishna and go back to Godhead. What does it matter if someone says something? Why are we so concerned? We should be concerned there are hundreds and thousands and millions of living entities who are not chanting Hare Krishna. It doesn't matter if someone says something to me that I don't like. I should get my book bag and go out and distribute books and try to help others. Yeah. This is the mood of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. Let us try to help others. If we become absorbed in that mood, then the inevitable problems will seem completely insignificant. Are there any questions? All right, let's finish that. All glories to Srila